during our brief time together here, I'm going to be talking about steering on target. So that's both from the designer's perspective and from the marketing director's perspective about what on target means. So we'll be answering these questions like, what does it mean for a designer to be on target? And how can designers ensure their work is dubbed on target by whoever's receiving the work? In other words, let's talk about how designers can ensure success while working with marketing personnel. All right, so we'll start by at least acknowledging that I'm not a designer by trade, personally. I do have a light design background, and I very frequently guide designers across various marketing projects, but I'm very much more on the marketing personnel side of business operations. Specifically, I'm a fractional CMO. I work at Abel & Howe, providing in-source marketing services to various clients throughout the years. And you may not know what in-source marketing is, so only for context for my particular skill set, I just want to take a moment to explain what that is. In-source marketing is a, it's a service model that's built around building a marketing system, uh, system for scaling companies and transferring all that information back in-house to that company. So this involves things like guiding strategies and growing internal talent growing internal processes, and ultimately trying to work towards an exit when the time is right. So my credentials are I have a degree in psychology, a degree in marketing, a master's in business, and business is our topic today. You're in the design business, you're in the art business, and you need both. You need design and business. And ensuring success while working with marketing personnel is taking into account the business-related activities around you. So we'll start off easy just with a quick quote that aligns more with my personal mantra. And my mantra is very much built on the belief that transferable leadership is true leadership that's infectious and can be spread across the organization. And this is a very uh, new modern version of the term leadership where it is transferable. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, uh, just going to continue there. Yeah, so talking about how l true leadership can be expressed by anyone within the organization. And right here, Napoleon Hill says, it's literally true that you can succeed best and quickest by helping others to succeed. Well, isn't that true? Um, and that's kind of our theme for today, where we're all in business together, whether you're a professional designer, or even if you work alone, you're still collaborating with your inputs and you're being examined by, um, as a result of your outputs. So the more we can work towards getting on the same page as business professionals, the more successful everyone can be. So I'm going to start with just outlining our session concepts for today. Um, the type of things that we're going to be learning are the full scope of marketing and how design fits into that ecosystem, the differing motivations between marketing and design. I think we all know there are very different motivations, so let's unpack those and find out what they are. Um, how designers can work with marketing teams effectively and potential designer blind spots, blind spots that I see that designers have that we can talk about, what constitutes proper project delegation, how to compensate for inexperienced directors, which is very common, and ways to make your design work sticky within the organization. This is specifically for those people who are working in a role already as a designer. Well, do you want to keep your job and you want to grow within that company? Do these things that I'm going to tell you about and it'll be great. Um, same thing with if you're a freelancer and you get a, a gig and you want to get more referrals and more gigs out of it, follow those steps. And th that's what we'll do toward the end, which probably won't take too long for us to get there. But the main point that I want to share with you is just the perspective of how to navigate your projects and your relationships and to empower you with leadership as a designer. Um, many people you work with will not understand your role. You're probably already feeling that and they won't know how to work with you. And my point of this entire piece is it's up to you to pave your path and fill in those communication gaps and foster allies. And this requires things like empathy and communication and assertiveness, all those things that they probably didn't teach you in design school. So let's, let's hop in. I'll start by asking a question. Are designers marketers? I think so, 100%. I, 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 could, I could win this argument. Um, and, and the reason being is that if you represent a company, that company is a brand. And if you're creating something visual that rep represents that brand, you're adding to the brand experience. And of course, that is marketing. And even if it's just an internal document, 
that's still adding to the experience of the people who are within that company. It's all, it's, it's, it's all connected. And especially if it's consumer facing in any way. So as marketers, all of us right here, it's important that designers get a glimpse into the full marketing environment. So let's do that now. This is the marketing stack that I want to talk about, which is, you know, when most people hear the term marketing or they, their understanding of marketing, they think of advertising, content marketing, email marketing, taglines, logos, media mentions. And in reality, all that stuff is just, you know, one, two, three levels of a more complete stack, layers within this marketing stack. So here it is in a pie chart. I'll, I'll, I'll scroll to the next one. Let's just look at it as far as an actual stack. And I, I want to go through all these different aspects and domains of marketing real quickly, just so you can really see the full spread of marketing is more than just you know running a Google Ads campaign or um, having a, a, a magazine article or, or having an influencer mention you. Uh, it's, it's a full system that has so many different cogs to it. So first, product and service. That is, in fact, what marketing is. You're taking a product to market. It needs to have a segment of the audience that actually cares about it. So you need to align your product with the market. And there's certainly a design component to that aspect. Brand messaging, um, marketing assets, which are things like your website or you know even more traditional assets like uh, flyers and whatnot. Um, marketing funnel, which is the actual marketing that goes into it. When I say marketing, I mean things like channels, channel forward marketing, like your, whether it's digital or whether it's word of mouth or referral or whatever it is, all that is related to the marketing funnel. You have the investment tracking, which is where you're actually tracking what's actually going on with all of these assets in relation to the funnel. You have your talent. This is the biggest piece that people don't really acknowledge, which is marketing is more than what you're doing consumer forward. It's the team of people who represents your organization in the back end that's making it all happen. That's the most important part by a country mile. Then you have your tech stack, whether it be internal or consumer forward tech stack, all of your software and how it inter interacts with each other is a very big predictor of your success, dependent on industry, but generally that's true. Your sales process, sales is marketing. Anytime you're representing your brand, you are marketing. And then your knowledge, um, you know, trying to get away from disposable marketing and trying to get compound interest year after year. All of this stuff are different layers to the marketing stack that we need to take into account. So from that, I think it's really important to acknowledge that this domain exists and marketing is very wide, but how does design actually fit into the whole sequence? So, I, you know, it might fit into absolutely everything here, but I wanted to highlight that uh, for instance, product and service, there's a huge design component to this. When you're bringing your product to market, you need to have a visual experience because consumers bake, base decisions, buying decisions on emotions far more than they do on rationale. Uh, there's rationale criteria for eliminating potential uh, people who they'll interact with or, or brands they'll interact with, but largely people make decisions based on emotion and that's why the design element of product and service is so important. Then you have things like your marketing assets, like the, the a big one is your website. Uh, this is obviously a very big design component that designers are involved in. Then you have things like talent. Uh, designers are talent, but you're working within an ecosystem of all sorts of other marketers in, in the same system. So you have line managers and coordinators and um, specialists and directors and all sorts of things. And you also have designers and programmers and software engineers and all that. So this is something we should take into account today, at least when we're talking about being successful with working with your marketing team. And finally, knowledge management. So what I mean by that is when you make um, something, it's a, I don't know, a PSD file, where do you store it? Who knows it's there? How are they going to use it? Is it something you should eliminate because it's just, uh, it's, it's just noise on a hard drive somewhere? Or is it something that's really important? And who's managing all this stuff? And where are you going to share it? And what methodology? What security do you have? What privacy do you have? Who owns what? All that is knowledge management. Management is a very big domain that I think gets overlooked when it comes to design. So where are we now? Let's talk about motivation. So far, we've had a quick overview of what the marketing system is. Now let's talk about the various motivations between designers and marketers within that system. So first off, I'll tell you that in my experience, successful teams are aware that team members have different motivations. Successful teams are the ones that acknowledge that not everyone has the same um, motivations within the organization. And we should have, all have common goals. Great organizations rally people in a vision so that we're all working toward the same thing, but it's perfectly healthy to acknowledge that we're not motivated by the same stuff. 
So here I want to point out under the lens of designers, and, and this doesn't this doesn't go for everybody. This isn't every single designer, but for the most part, I think this is mostly accurate in the sense that designers, when they're going to have a design project or one a one-off or a long sequenced phased project, generally they like that project to have a high degree of artistry. Designers are artists. Why do, else would they be designers? And sometimes, I don't know, maybe if they're working real quick, they don't want it to have a lot of artistry, or maybe they're really uh, simplistic d design style, but th that there's an artistry to simplicity. So I always say that I feel like designers want to be quite artistic. I don't think that that's overly debatable. Then we have things like mindless or creative. Generally, people are passionate about their job. So if you're in a creative role, you want to be creative in the projects you're doing. Then you have things like your technique. Do you want it to be basic or advanced? You could probably riff on the stuff that you already know and do some simple stuff, but generally we like to be pushing the envelope and, and have things be more advanced. Uh, disjointed versus united, what I mean here is when you're approaching a project that has several other appendages that are in relation, are these things all a part of a unified project where you're having unified output? Are they united? Or are they disjointed? And this could be argued. Some people want to reinvent a brand almost every time they put pen to paper. And some people want to have consistency for years and years and years, even decades, with that same brand. So different designers might have different motivations along this spectrum. Then we have things like whether you're collaborative or autonomous. I know that there's lots of designers who like to collaborate. Um, but also I know that there's uh, an inner drive to you know, sit in front of your computer or have sit in front of your drafting desk or whatever it may be and be autonomous and be allowed to be artistic and experience freedom. So if these are the designer motivations, um, it, it'd be great to also, you know, in, 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 the, in the questions section, uh, if, if anybody wants to, you know, that chat function on Zoom, if anyone wants to add one of their designer motiva motivators, let us know, we can chat about it. But generally I think this is a somewhat representative set. Let's cross reference this against marketers. And right away, you're going to see that it's pretty different. It's, it's not necessarily, I don't even think that one of these variables is the same. Um, you're going to notice that some of these are contradictory. You know, I'll be the first to put up my hand and say that marketers can be difficult sometimes. Uh, uh -huh. we, can, we can definitely uh, ask for something that's impossible. For instance, um, in isolation, quality of, of course, we want things to be high quality. We want it yesterday, and we don't have to pay a bunch of money for it. But in in unison, these three variables can't exist together. You, you can't have things that are high quality and fast and cheap. If it's high quality and fast, it's going to be expensive. And if you want to have high quality and you don't want to pay a lot of money, it's going to be really slow. And so these are things that I think marketers need to acknowledge when they're working with designers. Um, th th there's other pieces that we can chat about as, as we go along these. For instance, um, low brand consistency or high brand consistency. Well, some brands are more consistent than others. Um, some brand documents are, you know, 100 pages long and you need to follow them. And when they give it to a designer, the designer is pretty much just churning out whatever this book is dictating for them to do. Others allow more freedom. And so not every marketer would have high brand consistency as polarized as I have it here. Some of them would have it over here. And what we're driving toward is what really is unknown when a marketer, when a marketing director or line manager delegates something is that they do, don't generally express whether they care about consistency or a high consistency or low consistency on a project level. Sometimes they probably do, but a lot of times they don't, and that causes trouble for designers. Same thing for um, dependability. Some designers are just wanting to, or some marketers are wanting to solicit a bunch of designers for exploratory designs. Others are looking for somebody who's dependable, that they don't need to worry about, that they can just give things to and it can get done. I generally I think that more people are looking for that dependable aspect. But some of the concepts that we can explore is how can we bring our motivations into alignment based on whoever is owning this spectrum? When there's a line manager, they have their own internal um, polarizations towards all of these different motivators and designers don't know it. And when they're delegating it back to designers, they might not know that the designer is actually very polarized on this level or on the other level. And we need to find a way to expunge and communicate past all of these potential barriers. Um, at the same time, uh, I, I think it's really important for line managers to better communicate their mantra. And these types of discussions or these types of tools are, are really great to at least open the discussion there. Um, 
it'd be awesome for us to identify conflicting motivations early in a project. Then later in a project when we're unpacking what happened, let's first unpack what, what's going to happen. So this is pretty much what I've said so far, circling around the contradictions that marketers and line managers and marketing directors and marketing personnel has when they're going and asking of something from a designer. But let's unpack some of the common blind spots that we have as designers, because uh, I'll be honest, I'm, I work with designers quite often, and I notice various aspects uh, from various designers that they just aren't taking into account. So let's address this and uh, address the realities. So I'll go through these quickly, but really let's talk about unclear roles. Mm -hmm. um, th th this, this is big, I'll, I'll read the cartoon. Why do designers think uh, they're marketers when they're not, says the marketing director, and why do marketers think that they're designers when they're not, says the designer. <laughs> and this, this really does happen all the time. Um, it's that feeling, it's that siloed feeling of opposition. Um, it's a very adversarial um, reality that we have when I'm the marketer, therefore I own this, and I'm the designer, and therefore I own this. And it's, it isn't right. You're both designers. I'm a designer, not because I have a design background to some degree, it's because I work with designers collaboratively toward getting the output that I want from the design. I'm in charge of a lot of the inputs and the coaching and the feedback that makes me a designer. And as I've already said, designers are marketers. And the sooner that both sides can respect this, we can start working with each other without this territoriality. The more you understand about each other's knowledge and the gaps that we have within our knowledge, the more we can define how to work with each other effectively. So I want to acknowledge a lot of times roles aren't clear and you're just working on what you're given. And this is kind of one of those blind spots, which let's overcome that. Let's overcome that gap. Um, same thing with uh, timelines. Timelines matter so, so much, so much. Um, and sometimes you as designers are not given proper timelines which makes you think that they don't matter or makes you think that, the, that that's just something that's accepted within the system. And that's something we need to overcome as well. Um, the absent creative brief. This isn't necessarily designer's fault if they think that that's supposed to come from the marketer. Sometimes you're not given one. Let's unpack that later on. Then this is a big one. The misaligned spirit of the project. What I mean by spirit of the project is somebody can give you a task but if you read between the lines about how they give it to you, under what context they're giving it to you, what their motivations are, you can kind of unpack what the spirit of the agreement is. Is the spirit, we just need something quick because this doesn't really matter and it's a technicality, this is 11th hour, let's just get it done. Or is this some fundamental design project that the entire fate of the brand depends on? You can really unpack a lot of the spirit of the project by asking questions and understanding tone and having empathy and reading context. So many times the project that you're given, this spirit is really improperly, poorly communicated. So let's address that as well. So now that we've identified from what I see, most of the blind spots that designers have when working with other business professionals and other marketing leaders, let's give you tips for working with marketing personnel. Um, straight up, let's just hop into it. So first off, um, I would say define your leadership. So what I mean by that is marketers, line managers, uh, marketing directors, marketing personnel, they want to be led through a process. If, if we're looking at you, if marketers are looking at designers as somebody who's going to design for us, generally speaking, we like to be comforted and coaxed into the idea that the designer has a process and that we're being taken care of. You know, we have a request, we try and outline what the quest, request is, and then we're in good hands. Um, you know, a lot of people get onboarded onto teams or a, a new company, or maybe they're freelancing, and the marketer that they're working with isn't intuitive enough to say, oh, and by the way, I don't really have a process for you, and I'm counting for you to guide me through that entire process. If they were upfront with that, I think that we'd have a lot better results, but this is implied. And that's kind of what I'm telling you here right now, which is the more you can take a leadership role for the design portion of the project, the more successful your projects will be. So. Uh, what I mean by that is filling prob uh, problematic process gaps. Just as an example, if you're given a project and right away you can see flaws with it, like, oh, the timeline isn't long enough, or I'm not given this information until too late in the project, I know, I've seen it, a lot of designers don't tell this to the person that's delegating to them. They tell their friend, or they tell their spouse when they get home. 
This does no one any good. Taking more of a leadership role and taking ownership and saying, hey, I noticed that you've given me a project. Let me tell you how I would approach this project. Man, the, the, the marketing professional would love you for that because they don't know how the design project really should be unfolded. That's something they view as being your job. So same thing with uh, providing uh, pro proactive education for stakeholders. That means identifying the gaps in knowledge for the marketer that you're speaking with, or at least coaxing and probing into their mind to find out if there are in fact gaps there. Um, my, my main message is understand that receiving delegation doesn't mean that you're not a leader. You are the design leader of that project. So next is develop a creative brief. Templates, lots of creative brief templates. Um, Make them as simple as possible without compromising the details you need to define on target. So that's back to that idea of on target. A lot of times designers make really cool things that are off target. And then everyone's scratching their head going, what, what went wrong here? This looks nice, but it's just not the right emotion or it's the wrong spec or well, whatever it is. We all know how many variables can go into a creative brief. The creative brief really, there always should be one. And when I say one, I don't necessarily mean a massive document that sits on your desk. A creative brief can be as sparse as a, a in-depth conversation with the right person that's recorded or you take notes on. That could be a creative brief. That's fine. On the fly, that works. Generally, I like it to be something that's actually submitted so you can reference it later on. So I make creative briefs um, for all the designers I work with, and I encourage them to take ownership of what the creative briefs actually have in it. I don't want to be the one di dictating this is what a creative brief looks like. Go online. There's a million creative brief templates, but find the right variables that work for you and, and have an evolution with those uh, templates and constantly be working on them and prompt people who are not giving you creative briefs. Hey, by the way, I noticed you didn't give me any information on this project. Please fill this out. So that would be making it really easy to share is very big. Um, otherwise, they probably won't do it. People are busy. I love Google Drive, you know, SharePoint, whatever it is. Um, and then add an adjustment, as I said, based on experience. That's really big. Do that. If one thing, do this thing. Next is scrutinize the creative brief inputs. So it's one thing to give somebody a creative brief, but we all know not everyone fills out a form. If you've ever done any like uh, quantitative surveys, men or qualitative even, you can really get some bad um, surveys r tossed back to you. So you need to make sure that you are looking and scrutinizing Sure, you asked for something, but did you actually get it? So empower yourself to say no if something isn't feasible. What I mean by that is if the marketer comes back and the creative brief is, oh, and this needs to be done in a week, empower yourself to say no. They will respect you more for this. They will come back and ask you for more projects because they know that you're reliable and you're dependable because you're taking that aspect seriously. Taking ownership of your projects is what you should be doing with that uh, first phase of becoming that leader, that design leader, this is where you're actually doing it. This is where you're asking somebody for the creative brief inputs and if they're not, if they're inadequate, to stand up and say so. Uh, scrutinize the inputs for accuracy and highlight the manager's unknown unknowns. I think I have a slide after this one. Here's the, I think, I think we've probably all seen this example, but I really know it resonated with a lot of people. Um, when you give a designer 10 minutes, this is your output. When you give a designer one minute, this is your output. 12 seconds, this is your output. And so there's diminishing returns when you start putting those constraints with designers. Well, if your creative brief has a, um, a time component to it and it comes back and it's unreasonable, this is the type of education that you should be showing marketers because they need to understand, like at the end of the day, they're the ones who are accountable for their project and they will happily give you more time if they know that it will reflect better on them and the system and the team that they're working within. But if we're silent about these types of realities, then everybody loses. And also, des guiding the design process. So what I mean by this is you should have some flexible methodologies that are you know, prefab when you go into any project. So your personal design process, I think, reflects your personal brand. Um, if you're detail-oriented and you're methodical, you will be, that, that's what people are looking for. Um, obviously they want good designs, that's a table stake. But those types of um, dependability and being methodical and being organized and having a process, these are the things that marketers, you know, the traditional uh, definition, are actually looking for. So my example here is identify milestones. Have that creative brief. Um, ask them for inspiration examples or build that into your retainer for you providing them inspiration and examples. 
that's a huge component. You know, I've been a part of so many projects where that milestone doesn't happen, and there's a way higher likelihood for that project to fall through the floor than if you're prompted with lots of discussion around, I like this, I like this, but more so, this is on target, this is off target for me, and here's why. Um, have a style guide. Before you start designing every aspect of your design, focus on a tiny little thumbnail and, and, and build out a style guide, get approval on that, and get more confidence for the other facets of your project. Prototyping mm -hmm. and then different design sets, build in reviews. If, if I'm working with a designer and they say, great, I can get that done in a week. And I'm like, well, are there going to be any revisions? Oh, well, yeah, if there needs to be revisions, then it's going to be two or three weeks. Right there, I just lost trust in that designer because they didn't prompt me for the full reality of the situation. Nobody ever gets anything done the first crack. Be that person yeah. that acknowledges that. Okay. I think this is my last slide before we move on to how to become sticky within the organization. This is just an example of a chart that I use with uh, various designers where we have different variables. You can design, you can decide on these all by yourself. You can obviously rework this entire piece. It's just more of a placeholder for a, an idea. Um, are you corporate or are you casual? Are you extremely corporate, ex moderately corporate, somewhere in the middle? And by marking all of these different variables, we're allowing to acknowledge what the target is so the designer can steer toward it. And if you're missing an actual path towards what our target is, if you can't describe after you've been delegated, I know what's on target, you're in trouble. You're going to waste a lot of time. You're going to be frustrated. Everyone's going to be frustrated and no one's going to win. Okay. So that kind of brings me a bit to a close on that last section. Um, if anybody has any questions, please put it in the chat. But for right now, I'm going to move on to our last sequence before questions, which is where we talk about how to become sticky within an organization. So from the business aspect, you're a great designer, you do great designs, you, you know, you know, Photoshop, you know, Illustrator, I don't know, you UX pin, whatever it is, you know, all the software. But when working with an organization, there's so many things beyond what you were taught in design school that will make you sticky, that will make you, will keep them coming back for more, or more so, make them need to come back for more because they can't find somebody else who just has that je ne sais quoi that we're going to describe here. Okay. So first, um, you know, I've, I hire lots of marketing professionals, I hire lots of designers, and I, I recently, uh, well, working with other um, people in my company, we did an article where we talked about the soft skills that you should hire for for each marketing function within an organization. I think it was called the most important traits to hire for across each marketing function. And I wanted to draw that to your attention because there's a designer section here. It's really quick. It's a quick read. But essentially, the ones that I'm highlighting here are things like organization, time management, advisory skills, which translates to that leadership that I was talking about, and intuition. So let's impact, uh, unpack what we mean by a lot of these in these steps on how to become sticky within your organization. The first thing I would do if I were you would is identify who your main line manager is, or maybe you have several, and reach alignment with them. So put in the work up front to understand what the line manager is after. Not just from a design perspective, but from a your function perspective, from it from a, the design aspect of their marketing system, system, what are they looking for? Don't assume, ever. You need to ask and you need to um, probe into their mind to understand and get in alignment with them. Strike a balance between listening to what they're saying, repeating what you heard them say and get verification, and providing them education in those unknown unknowns to them that you're exposing along the way. Um, I find that watching a designer visibly care about the process is one of the most relieving things I can get as a director uh -huh. is, you know, seeing this person essentially say, you know, that thing that you care about, I care about it too. And I'm going to be proactive and work on it with you, man. You can, you can get um, uh, so many, so many more miles of freedom out of someone like me. If you can prove and build that type of trust with these types of actions. So next, is, as I've kind of alluded to, leading with communication, using your voice, guide the process, force the issue, confront conflict in a professional manner. Um, the third is showcasing intuition, which is something that I highlighted in that blog article. Intuition is what we do when we don't have things like a creative brief. Intuition is what you do when the path isn't necessarily 
spelled out for you. And what I'm doing here is I'm acknowledging that no matter how good the creative brief is, there are going to be aspects that you just need to use your best judgment for. So um, requesting for a marketer to spell it out for you from ABC all the way to Z, it, that will take too much of their time and you're actually hurting your function within the company because you're a hand that needs holding. By facilitating the rough idea of what you need in terms of knowing what on target is and carrying the rest through on intuition is one of the best traits you can possibly have as a designer. This builds trust. It, it shows the line managers that they, they don't need to micromanage. They can, it can free them up for other things and that they can depend on you. And they, maybe you can even train other people around you to be similar that it adds so much more value within the organization. The next one is meeting deadlines. Um, yeah. th this one should be obvious. Somehow it's not. Meeting deadlines is so, so, so big. Um, I've worked with amazing designers, people who are just inspiring. And because they don't hit deadlines, I can't work with them anymore. And I tell them that and it just doesn't work out. And I feel like there's something going on in the background, which is um, there's that, you know, I think that what Apple computers did this to us. They're like, if you're creative, you're this way. And if you're business minded, you're this way. And if you look like me with glasses and a collared shirt, you gotta be here. And if you're wearing a beret, you gotta be over there. And it's just, it's all nonsense. It's complete rubbish. Um, the idea that someone can't be accountable for deadlines because they're creative, I categorically cannot accept and neither can any marketer. That's just a reality you're gonna have to, to live with. It's the design business, business and design together. And business is dependability and you need to focus on your deadlines. So let's acknowledge some things here because I'm not trying to berate you saying like, how dare you not get your deadlines? I sympathize with you. You're not given deadlines. As a designer, you're often in that situation where you're either given way too much work that's impossible, it's impossible to finish because you're given way too many things on too steep deadlines, or you're given a bunch, like a hundred different projects and none of them have deadlines. So how am I supposed to prioritize this myself? And then a month later, that line manager comes and says, it's not done yet. And you're like, well, I've been doing all this stuff over here and it, all, it does make sense, but it's not something that people care about. It's not acceptable. So what do you do in those situations when you're not being given the proper amount of information that you need? And I can tell you, which is if you're organized and if you're diligent, um, you can tell how long it's going to take to do something. So right away you can say, uh, I can't have it done by this time because that's not, I just need more time for that. Or if you're actually using some type of project management software, or you're just very diligent with knowing what projects you have on the fly, you can actually know how long the entire set is going to take you. And you can say, I have a problem here because you actually, I, you've already given me three projects and I don't know which one's priority, which one is priority. If you just passively receive work without bringing up those types of logistical issues, people will lose faith in you because it is your job to actually do those things. And that is one piece of project management. I know there's another um, speaker um, workshop um, with the GDC is doing that's around project management. Tune into that one because it's, it's very important to take personal accountability for your type of project management. So we want to know things, um, be organized and um, commit to things like how long will it take know what your capacity is, what your confidence level is on your, when you, wh whether you'll be get it, able to get it done, and what your runway is. What, what are some contingencies? What if it takes longer? What's, what, build in some padding to your system. If you can do that and say no to the projects that fall outside of this whole spectrum, you're going to be really, really valued and, and people are going to be happy to give you less work, I'll tell you that much. Um, don't just take the work and ignore the problem. And finally, this is the last piece before we're getting to some questions, is defining your value. Um, you know, the output that we've talked about, designer output, this is big, it's table stakes, you need to be a good designer, you need to understand the essence, uh, the target of what you're trying to do and do that thing, that's great. But the additional soft pieces that I'm talking about, like dependability, and being able to collaborate um, without territoriality with other marketing professionals, to be able to show appropriate leadership um, within your domain and be able to show empathy and understanding. These are all very big pieces that will display your values so much more than just churning out good designs. Um, and finally, things like tacit and explicit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is knowing the things that, well, the knowing of things that you don't know quite how you know. This is the intuition and judgment aspect. And then the explicit knowledge, the things that you can explain to other people. And these are great for potential coll collaboration and knowledge transfer. If you can embody tacit and explicit knowledge visibly 
um, your value within the organization will be very defined. Okay, so that's pretty much my spiel. I've said everything that I want to in the sense that I hope I've empowered some designers to be able to up their game from the business aspect of things and become sticky within an organization.